Hallo på den. I dag har vi en skikkelig god en fra arkivet. Den er spilt in med Tom Erik Voye og Martin Tronsen i Los Angeles. Og vi har mött uh, en man som har laget uh, det meste av det du har sett av tatoveringer i amerikanske storfilmer. Som for eksempel George Clooney sin fra From Dust Till Dawn. Wesley Snipes i Blade-filmene. Blood In, Blood Out. Han er gjengmedlem på ekte. Forfatter, musiker og tatovør på verdens kjente Mark Mahoney's Shamrock Social Club på Sunset Street i Los Angeles. Velkommen, Freddy Negretti. Ok, well, um, it really starts uh, with me. Growing up in a Chicano neighborhood, you know, in the, in the whole East L.A. gang lifestyle. So when I was really young, like uh, 12 years old, I uh, I went to Juvenile Hall. And when I was there, I ended up in a, a, a holding cell <clears throat> with a guy that was older, like uh, 16, 17 years old. And he had these Chicano-style tattoos, crosses, and jesus head and his neighborhood you know his gang and stuff tattooed on him you know i was just i was just a little guy i was in there for uh running away from home and i met this this uh, older cholo gangster guy and he had these tattoos and i was like wow you know and he was being really cool to me you know and uh i started looking at his tattoos and i asked him how did you do that you know he goes oh you get a needle and thread wrap the thread around the needle melt the needle in a, into a toothbrush dip it in Indian ink and just poke it. So <clears throat> when I got out of juvenile hall, uh, I got the stuff right away and uh, I covered my arm with little hand poke tattoos that, uh, <clears throat> you know, that I did. I was like 12 years old and I became really obsessed with it. Then, you know, <clears throat> not long after that, I joined a gang and, uh, you know, I, I uh, always had art ability, you know, since I was a kid and my dad was an artist and whatnot. And so I became like uh, the neighborhood tattoo guy, you know, uh, tattooing on all the homies doing, you know, little placas. This is called a placa, like this. El Coyote, that was my nickname, SG, Sangra. That's how I first started. And then uh, some of the older homeboys that went to prison uh, they were really good with the hand poking tattoos, you know, and <clears throat> so uh, my older homeboys would get out of prison and show me things, you know, and and uh, so I got pretty good with it, you know, uh, just uh, I was doing big old tattoos with just uh, hand poking, you know. So then uh, by the time I went to, uh, so when I was uh, 17, you know, uh, I got arrested for some gang stuff, and uh, I went to Youth Authority. <clears throat> uh, youth Authority is like a state prison for minors, you know. It's kind of like where we start out. But anyways, uh, and I got in a lot of trouble in there, and I ended up in this this lockup for like criminally insane kids, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was called the Tamarack Program. And so... Uh, but we had a lot of communication with the guys in prison, and uh, they showed us, you know, uh, a design of how to make a tattoo machine out of a uh, eight-track tape player, you know, the motor. It's how to make a rotary machine. And, um, you know, the guards, the prison guards there, they knew that we were all crazy, and as long as we didn't kill each other, they didn't care what we did in that little that little dungeon it was like a dungeon you know it was real old and it was like off off to the side of this big institution you know it was like all down a hill it was like a, a haunted jail <laughs> it was pretty crazy you know and um well anyways the staff let us tattoo there you know and so i learned to do it with a homemade tattoo machine and being there about three years and tattooing every day you know they let us tattoo you know and we were all covered, and I got really good at it, you know. The staff believed that I could get a job at a tattoo shop. In fact, I tattooed some of the prison guards, you know, like, 
you know, they saw how good I was getting with it that they even, you know, would lock me in my cell and I'd tattoo them, you know. So uh, anyways, they sent me to board, you know, with a recommendation that I get a year cut off my time because they thought that I could make it as an artist. They didn't say tattoo artist. So anyways, um, you know, I got out and uh, immediately I set up my little kit in my in my apartment with my girlfriend and I started tattooing people, you know, with uh, the homemade tattoo machine, you know. And uh, at the very same time, you know, the, the buzz in the neighborhood around East L.A. and San Gabriel Valley was that there was a tattoo shop called Good Time Charlie's and that there was this guy working there named Weddle, who was Jack Rudy, and that they were doing, you know, the, the prison-style tattooing, you know, and that's what everybody wanted. They wanted their tattoos to look authentically from prison, you know. And so uh, I started seeing, you know, the tattoos that he was doing. I was like, wow, this stuff looks pretty good, you know. And and uh, so I would send people to him, you know, that I tattooed, you know, to show him this, show him your tattoo, you know. And so then these guys came to my apartment and said, hey, you know, that guy Weddle, uh, Jack Rudy, he wants you to go to the tattoo shop. He wants to talk to you, you know. You know, so I went over there and I took my folder of drawings. See, because uh, when I was in Youth Authority, before I went to that lockup program, I worked in the print shop. And uh, and what we did was uh, the way we got tattoo designs out to other prisons and to the streets was uh, we, we printed stationery with lines. And then at the bottom of the, of the stationery page uh, was a drawing that I that I did and we uh, printed it on the stationery and that drawing was actually a tattoo design and then we would mail stacks of that stationery to all the prisons and and people would send it home you know so those designs made it everywhere one of those designs was a smile not cry later design and another one was this uh, like a chara girl you know like a revolutionary girl with a big Mexican hat and a yeah. gun bullet and she was standing like this, wearing Daisy Dukes. So when I went to the tattoo shop uh, to talk to Jack, I noticed that some of my designs were on the wall. You know, some of the designs I did in prison, you know. And I, and I told Jack, I'll go, hey, uh, you, these are my designs. You have some of my designs. And he's going, man, everybody says that. Everybody says that their cousin in prison or somebody they know drew this design. And I go, well, I got the originals right here, you know. So then, uh, and then Jack, I brought some people that I tattooed, and Jack, you know, uh, you know, he was impressed with what I was doing. I showed him the machine that I was using and stuff. And so, anyways, and that's all that I heard uh, from Jack for a while. So meanwhile, I went back to my apartment and continued to do my tattoos. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Good Time Charlie, who you know, owned Good Time Charlie's, and Jack Rudy worked for him, had had become a born-again Christian and decided that he was going to quit tattooing. So he, uh, he quit tattooing, and he wanted to sell his tattoo shop. So uh, Ed Hardy, at the time, who was... Ed Hardy was the man. He... He uh, had did already so many things with tattooing, you know, publishing wise, and he introduced the Japanese style to to the tattoo world, and he also introduced this uh, new black and gray style, fine line style, you know. And when he saw that Good Time Charlie was selling his shop, he didn't want it to fall into the wrong hands, so he bought the shop. And uh, I guess he told Jack, "Look, we got to get." somebody else in here to work and Jack told him about me Ed thought it would be good because you know I could relate to the people there you know because what the people they were tattooing were just cholo gangsters you know so Jack sent a word you know and um, I went over there and you know a couple of days later I was working you know at Good Time Charlie's for Ed Hardy and uh, Jack Rudy so that's uh, basically kind of how I got started in yeah so how did you end up uh, here on the street well you know a lot this is back in the 70s you know and a, a lot has happened since then 
I, uh, you know, I continued tattooing in East LA, but then in 1980, I, I quit tattooing as well. Um, there was, uh, like this phenomenon thing happening in East LA where all these gangsters were turning to the Lord, you know? And then, uh, a lot of these guys I was in prison with, and I knew them as like killers, you know, hardcore guys. And all of a sudden they had Bibles and they're talking about Jesus, you know. And so anyways, um, they caught me at a time when I was having trouble with my marriage and, you know, I was having trouble with drugs. And so, you know, I, I uh, joined their church. It was called Victory Outreach. And uh, they told me I had to quit tattooing. That was difficult. Anyways, I quit, and uh, not long after that, I left the church, you know, and because I didn't agree with some of the stuff they were saying, you know, and then, so, uh, so I decided, well, you know, I'll go to college. So, I went to college, and uh, I actually, uh, I graduated, and I got a master's degree, you know, and, um, and then in 1990, exactly 10 years later, I really felt the urge to get back into tattooing and Jack Rudy had been you know calling me you know uh, about saying you know hey tattooing's gotten really big and a lot of people know your name and now's a good time to come back and so I came back to tattooing in 1990 and I went to work for uh, Jack Rudy in San Diego at uh, uh, San Diego Tattoo Land and uh uh, not long after that, I met this uh, Taylor Hackford, this movie director, who was looking for somebody to do tattoos for his uh, his movie, Blood In, Blood Out. Anyways, uh, I went to work for him, and uh, I worked on that movie like six months. And uh, during that time, I met this uh, makeup artist named Freddie Blau, who invented the uh, temporary tattoo uh, makeup kit. And uh, so I, um, I came to Hollywood, went to work for Gil Monte at Tattoo Mania, and I started doing temporary tattoos for movies, you know. Uh, Tattoo Mania is right down the street here on the Sunset Strip. And, uh, and then I did that till uh, 1993. Things that went pretty crazy around here during the riots in 1992. And I remember before the riots, I was... Uh, I was booked in advance for like six months. And after the riots, nobody was coming to L.A., <laughs> you know. So anyways, uh, I continued working in the movies, and uh, I went up to Santa Barbara, and I opened up my tattoo shop called Rata Tattoo. And, um, and that went really good up there. Uh, I was there for like seven years. And after the seven years, things went kind of bad. And I had to close the shop. It turned out they didn't want any tattoo shops on State Street up there. So, anyway, so I came back to Tattoo Mania. That was uh, in like 88, 89. And then um, I worked there for a while and continued doing movies and music and whatnot. And um, then Gil Mani sold the shop. And Mark Mahoney came over here because we were working together at Tattoo Mania. And about, it was about seven years now or so, and he opened up Shamrock. And about five years ago, I came to work for him here. So here I am. How was it working on Blood In, Blood Out? You had a part in that movie. Yeah, I had a part in a small part. It was really good, you know, and I, it was uh, the beginning of, I did like 30-some features, you know, like uh, one of the big ones being Blade, you know, the Blade trilogy, and I did a lot of TV things, but... Uh, Myself and this uh, Freddie Blau, we kind of pioneered this temporary tattoo thing because prior to Blood In, Blood Out, you didn't see too many tattoos on movies, you know. And so, um, but then as the popularity of tattooing was uh, growing with uh, rock stars and different personalities getting them and them being more visible on the scene... Of course, the media and the movies and television, you know, wanted to put them out there. So uh, I found myself with a lot of work, you know. 
and uh, eventually it kind of it slowed and stopped because they wanted tattoos so much for movies that if you're a makeup artist and you couldn't do temporary tattoos, then you were gonna get overlooked, you know, on on the movie because your name come when you're in the union, your name comes up, and uh, if they need blood, they need tattoos, they need whatever, you know, for that movie, they look at what the makeup artist does, and if he doesn't do tattoos, then whoosh, they go to the next guy, you know, so, but anyways, uh, I had a lot of fun with that for, you know, like uh, 13 years or something. Yeah, did you do work on From Dust to Dawn also? Yeah. So, I heard it was a lot of uh, problems with the makeup stuff in that uh, movie, with the union. Uh, uh, that was, uh, I... Um, there, I think you might be talking about Blade. Yeah, maybe. I think you're talking about Blade because what happened was, uh, the makeup artist who also makes the temporary tattoo, uh, stuff, he makes the blood. And, uh, <clears throat> in the very first Blade, there was a scene where, uh, they had blood coming out of the sprinkler system, you know, in like a party scene. And, uh, but they were, they were informed that the blood, you know, was, uh, organic, you know, because that way you can get it in your mouth and whatever. It has sugar in it and stuff, but they chose to run it through the, the ground and recycle it through canisters outside. So when it went outside, it got bad and everybody in that scene got really, really sick. Oh. And, you know, some people got hospitalized. And so they tried to sue Freddie Blau and then, uh. You know, he he ended up winning because of uh, his stipulation in the contract that they ignored. But they didn't use him for the tattoos anymore. They went straight to me. Yeah. You know, so I worked with uh, Wesley Snipes and uh, the the lady makeup artist. I forget her name. Anyway, she was a great lady. Because each movie we added to the tattoos, we made more on the shoulders. Some of it coming on the face. You know, by time Blade Three. So how was it working on uh, From Dust to Dawn with, uh, with Quentin Tarantino? On that one, um, they actually, because uh, another, you know, Gil Mani was uh, my partner in that one. Actually, I designed the one on for his neck, and then they had Gil on the set to apply it and, and, uh, and do the thing on his arm, yeah. you know. So on that one, I just did the design work, you know, the one for his neck, which is... Uh, which was uh, this real similar to the one on um, Last Action Hero, you know, with Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger. I did that one on the, the bad guy's neck, the tribal thing. And uh, th But those tattoos, like uh, uh, from Dust to Dawn, Blade, that really put tribal tattooing, it made it really, really popular, you know, so it was good. And then, uh, we, you know, we did some groundbreaking effects, like... Uh, on uh, this one, Tales from the Crypt, you know, we did a time sequence tattoo. Uh, we put this sticky stuff, you know, so that it looked like, because uh, we had him do it, hand tap it, you know. Like uh, the the tattoo artist was Heavy D, and he was uh, like a voodoo tattoo guy, you know. And so the tattoo that he did, you know, he did it, we had him do it like uh, tapping like Samoan style, you know. But it would came out like this big elaborate tattoo. Tia Carrera's face came out on the tattoo and the guy hated her, you know, so. And he kept trying to get the tattoo off, but the face kept coming back, you know. It was a, it was a good um, tattoo thing for us because we did some first on it with the time sequence thing and, and then uh, making the tattoo look like it was lasered off, you know, and making his chest all sore. So we did a lot of cool stuff with that. So what uh, what other movies did you work on uh, in that time period? Well, uh, like Con Air, yeah. Rising Sun, Falling Down, uh, you know, lots of uh, TV things too. So you basically did all the fake tattoos on TV in that time yeah. period? Yeah, during that time period, yeah. All the fake tattoos. All the, there was a couple that towards the end you could, you could tell uh, the difference between ours and the other fake ones, they were too black. Like if you see fake tattoos on a movie and they're too black, they're they're not using our process because we had a special process where the tattoos look aged. You know, kind of you know how they look, kind of bluish. 
under the skin, and so our tattoos really looked real. You used some uh, some thermal facts processing something. You know, at first, uh, you know, we we did like uh, if they were gonna have a tattoo that was just gonna, you know, work for a couple of days. A lot of times, I would just uh, freestyle it. I would just get a brush and that stuff and just paint it on, you know. Or if they needed a specific tattoo, I would uh, stick the stencil on, like a thermal flux stencil, lighten it up, and then go over it with a brush on, you know, with that tattoo stuff. But we had figured a, a way to to, um, to print, to make a thicker, uh, you know, uh, solution of the tattoo stuff, and then print the design on a on this uh, like newsprint paper, you know, and uh, and with 100% alcohol, you could stick it on with a stencil so long as you put these absorbent towels over it, you know, so it, there was a special way of doing it, and if you didn't know how to do it like that, then you would have a lot of trouble, and I, I think uh, that that's part of what might have happened with the uh, from dust to dawn, I think Gil had some trouble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, a couple of days ago, we talked to Tom Berg, who did the prison break uh, tattoo. Yeah, like and, uh, uh, he's, he was like, yeah, he didn't even get to touch the actors, so he uh, just does the artwork, and then they used like some. And the makeup artists do it. Yeah. And the makeup artists use that that makeup effect. Freddie Blau, he's got the yeah. the copyright of it. Yeah. So so uh, it's called real creation. So yeah, that's uh, that's. Basically, how it went back uh, back then. In order to work on a movie, you had to be in the union. So the union had approved me. I was like the only tattoo artist that could go in as a working TA. That's a technical advisor who can actually do work. You know, and and um, and that worked for you know for a long time. But now, yeah, a, a tattoo artist, they can have them design the tattoo and whatnot, but. They never do the application, you know. They just uh, the application is always done by the makeup artist, and that's because of the union. But fortunately, since uh, I was part of a groundbreaking, you know, crew, you know, uh, I got to go on all these movies and work on all these actors, and you know, it was uh, so it was a great experience for me. I want to talk a little bit about uh, your personal style, because uh, you know, back in Europe. A lot of people see you as kind of one of the godfathers of the fine lining and, uh, you know, just uh, uh, doing tattoos with only one liner. Yeah, yeah. Tattoo. Single needle, fine line tattooing. You know, the whole, uh, the whole principle of the fine line was so that you wouldn't see a lot of lines, you know. So the lines would be real thin and then you would see more shading, you'd shade off the lines. And so that we could try to make things look more real. You know, and I, I think that's what we were really trying to get more. The whole fine line thing was, you know, more real, you know, in a time when uh, tattooing, you know, was all traditional style. And uh, and they had the big bold lines with the bright colors and they were cartoonish looking, you know, and that that's what you would get at a tattoo shop. So um, when Jack Rudy and I were were taking this prison style and introducing it in a professional, you know, uh, realm. That's what we were really trying to get across was realism, portraits and beautiful pictures of Mary and Jesus and girls, you know, like, uh, you know. And so that's that's basically what, what we've done. And I think now, you know... Um, you know, the way we started it, you know, with the single needle and everything. And all these young, great artists, especially the European artists that do the realism. Because I think the Europeans first in the 90s took the black and gray style and ran with it first. Because the stuff that we were seeing coming out of Europe was so intensely real looking, you know. And uh, and so now I think it's the premier, premier, you know, style. Uh, here in America and everywhere, and everybody loves traditional and everybody loves Japanese, but 
It's the realism that blows you away. When you see a tattoo that looks so real, that is coming off the skin, that, that blows you away, you know. And so, and now with the, you know, I, I use the gray line as, a, as opposed to the thin line, you know, the single needle. I use a tight three, but uh, I do my line work mostly in gray, you know, and I found that that's, that's more effective than uh, a single needle line because even a single needle line can come out thick if it's put in a little bit too hard, you know. And actually the person, the best that I've ever seen besides Jack Rudy on, on working a single needle is uh, Mark Mahoney. And, you know, because you have to, ha have to have this tremendous control, you know, and, and you look at some of Mark's work, and it has all these little lines and sun rays and things. It's just really amazing, you know. So now I, I, I go more with a gray line, and, and I've actually learned a lot from uh, what these younger artists have, how they took what we were doing and, you know, and uh, advanced it, you know made it better so now I can take what they're doing you know and uh, make myself better and make my work cleaner and yeah. more real so I'm actually uh, in, in, a, in a learning process and I guess as artists we never do stop learning you know once you've arrived then you might as well just hang up your gloves <laughs> if you think you've arrived <laughs> you know you just give it up and yeah so one of the things that I really want to ask you about is uh, no, you've been around for a while in the industry, and uh, you've probably seen the way the TV shows and stuff is uh, kind of commercializing the tattoo, uh, whole tattoo industry. So, what is your take on like the Miami Ink and LA Ink stuff, and like the commercialism of the uh, Ed Hardy gear and turning like tattoos into some something that's for everyone? Well, you know, um, you know, I tried to do that. <laughs> myself you know uh years ago before before you know all this uh trendy stuff actually after we filmed blood in blood out and it was in the 90s and i actually i became good friends with taylor hackford you know the producer and you know and i had uh came up with an idea for a clothing line that uh would have big tattoo designs on them like dragons and big tribal stuff and it was like tight clothes for girls you know like uh like biker shorts but with tattoos all over it and stuff you know and uh he thought it was a great idea and then i also had the idea of putting drop tags on it explaining where the tattoo came from or if it was a tribal thing or japanese or whatever you know and then um and then taylor hackford uh he got us in with this uh clothing manufacturing uh company one of the biggest in california you know and they almost ran with it, you know, but they, uh, their sales uh, team had felt like it was too risky. They didn't know if people would buy it or not, and they wanted us to cover half the cost, you know. And so we didn't have that kind of money, you know. So it didn't, it didn't go through, but as we see later, you know, uh, tattoo style of art, and that's the idea that I had that, there's a distinct style to tattoo art, you know, and it it could be a mainstream style. People could recognize it as um, a mainstream style of art. As far as uh, once it reaches mainstream, you know, what becomes of it after that, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think it'll always be... A, represent coolness you know represent the dark side kind of which everybody kind of in a in as far as art goes likes to identify with you know the skulls and kind of the darkness you know and as long as it stays you know on the dark side then uh i think uh, people are gonna like it you know and as and uh with the tv shows you know i'm i'm kind of thankful for those uh shows i'm sorry that i'm not on one <laughs> but uh it definitely uh makes all of our job easier in one sense because it educates people that normally 
wouldn't know nothing about tattooing, you know. And, uh, you know, I haven't done a tattoo off the wall in I don't know how long because people come in and they have their artwork, you know, and they know a little bit about what's going on, you know, because they watch these shows, you know. And, uh, and that also increases the accountability, you know, uh, everywhere because people, less people are going to walk in and just have some Joe Blow, you know, scratch some shit on them, uh, some stuff on them, you know. You know, they're going to uh, investigate the artist, you know, they're going to look at his work and see if, you know, if that artist is good, en good enough to do what it is that they want. I think so far, you know, those those uh, and everybody loves the drama, you know. So, and I always thought that tattoo shops, you know, had a lot of drama and a lot of action things going on, you know, and weird people, different, you know. And that's that's fun to watch. That's fun to see. So, so long as they could, uh, you know, keep it as real as possible, you know, and less scripted as possible, and that's always, you know, difficult, you know. But um, that's my opinion on that. You've been in this business for a while, so what do you think is kind of the best thing about being a tattoo artist, the most comfortable thing? That it's, uh, it's um, one of the last, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, fine art, you know. Uh, when I was in college, you know, I, I uh, took art as a second, you know. And, you know, we had to do things with a ruling pen and compass, you know. And and then with the uh, computer graphics and, uh, you know, all that, that just did away with the whole, uh, you know, graphic art industry, you know. Uh, now, you know, just uh, somebody in the office could create, you know, uh, a page design or, you know, illustrate this and that from a computer. So... One thing that a computer will never be able to do, uh, at least in our time, I think, <laughs> is uh, actually do a tattoo, you know. You have to have an artist to do that. So, you know, that's one of the last pure fine art forms, you know. And so, and with uh, all these great artists, you know, like uh, years ago when when uh, I first started in the industry in the 70s, tattooing didn't require, you know, a, a lot of art ability. And so there wasn't great illustrators, you know, getting into it, you know. But now the door is open for these, uh, you know, great illustrators who just have, you know, this immense amount of talent and uh, and they're applying it to tattooing and, it's just phenomenal, you know, what, what they're doing. But uh, they weren't there before, but they're there. They're here now, you know. And so I think the more the doors got slammed in other forms of art, the more those artists, you know, found a, a, a life in tattooing and a way of expressing their art in tattooing. And you see a lot of these guys doing their art on canvas too, you know. And and doing the art shows. I'm all for, you know, I wish I had the time, you know, I learned how to paint a little and I painted murals and stuff, especially when I was in jail, you know, the sheriffs would always, you know, have me painting the whole jail with murals, you know, so, and I could do it. I wish I had more time to do it, but I appreciate, you know, uh, seeing all these art shows mixed with tattoo artists and, and I think they're finding other ways of being able to sell their art or at least get it out there with the tattooing, the photographs of the tattooing, and their work on canvas, you know. So, so I want to ask you about uh, your tattoos. Do you have some tattoos that has like a significant meaning or a cool story about them that you want to tell us about? Well, it you know, it seems like uh, what, what I've been uh, lately doing a lot of, uh, because because of all the sheriffs that I tattoo, yeah. and um, you know, and I I met these sheriffs mainly. Uh, it's already been like twenty years ago I started meeting the sheriffs because I was a tattoo artist, but I still had problems with drugs, and it would still land me in jail, you know. And when I go to jail, I would design tattoos for uh, 
you know, these, these sheriff guys in there. And then when I get out, I tattoo them. And it just turned into this whole thing. I, practically my whole clientele is, is uh, sheriff deputies. And I go do their parties. So I have done literally hundreds of Archangel Michaels, <laughs> you know, and all kinds of different ones, you know, and, uh, and, and the background. So what I've been doing a lot is uh, kind of following the art style of uh, Doré, you know, his uh, wood cuttings of, uh, you know, like uh, in the Divine Comedy and uh, Paradise Lost. Yeah, with you know, he illustrated uh, all the, all those angels and demons battling, and so that's really what I'm doing a lot of now, which I really enjoy. Is I got the Archangel Michael killing the devil in so many different ways. It's like uh, you know, like, <laughs> and then the background of all these battling angels. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and I like I like doing this like. Where it goes back and back, and they're so far back, they just look like a little cloud, you know. So there's some of that in my book. There's a bunch of it in my camera. Uh, I'll be having a, a lot of that stuff published, you know, at least on um, Facebook and MySpace soon. The later stuff that I've been doing is all this uh, these battles between angels and demons. You told us about the tattoo you have on your hand. Yeah. You have uh, other tattoos that have like uh... meaning like that. In 1980, at the tattoo convention in uh, in Sacramento, the National, and this is in 1980, I went up on the stage and I showed my, you know, gangster tattoos, yeah. and uh, nobody had seen, you know, like stuff like this, you know, like now everybody has it, yeah. you know what I mean? I did this in 1976, and uh, here's the original "Smile Now, Cry Later" that I did. I put a point on them, you know, and actually what it was is I used to look when I was uh, printing the uh, the stuff on stationery, uh, you know, I'd go through magazines, you know, looking for designs or design ideas, you know, or pretty girl faces and stuff like that. So I was looking through this magazine. I was in my cell, I remember, and then I, I saw this ad for uh, an acting workshop. And it had the, uh, you know, comedy tragedy masks right there. And I was like, that's pretty cool, you know. And um, there's this song that, uh, you know, it's an oldie song. I don't know if you've ever heard it. It's called Smile Now, Cry Later. And it's Smile Now, Cry Later. So anyways, I thought of that song when I looked at these masks because he was laughing and crying. And so I redrew them with this spike on the head and everything, and I put that song, Smile Now, Cry Later. And that took off. That's how those became the Smile Now, Cry Later masks. Yeah. So uh, we talked to a lot of people that, uh, that when we said, uh, yeah, we're going to see Fetty, they're like, oh, you have to see Fetty, he's a cool guy. He has a lot of stories. <laughs> and we were asked, like, yeah, what kind of stories? I can't tell. So uh, you lived a rough life. Uh -uh. The whole gangster thing, uh, going to prison. But uh, I've always stayed true to, you know, my roots. You know, like, uh, uh, you know, I never got out of the gang. You know, like, um, I'm, I'm, I'm still Coyote from Sangra, you know. And uh, even though I don't go around the neighborhood and run around and do malicious things or whatever, you know, that's still my identity is Coyote from Sangra. And part of that identi identity is, uh, you know, knowing a lot of people from prison, a lot of the, you know, like uh, connected Mexican guys and, you know, and um, big time gangsters and stuff. They, I'm a tattoo artist. They know me as a tattoo artist. I do their tattoos, you know, or do their ladies tattoos or whatever. But I've, I've uh, always kept it real with, with, uh, that part of my, you know, life, and uh, yeah, because of it, that I have some stories, especially, I guess when I had my tattoo shop in Santa Barbara, you know, so I ran things the way I wanted to run them, you know, and, and I had this gigantic building, you know, it's like with a three-bedroom apartment upstairs, and just, it was like 4,000 square feet, so 
I think a lot of the stories might have come from there. <laughs> so do you so. have any stories you want to share or do you want to keep it to yourself? <laughs> no, well, one thing, you know, uh, they used to call at Ratatat too, they, they uh, called us the whip people because, uh, you know, I know how to do the bull whips, you know. If things got slow, when when I first opened up uh, my tattoo shop, and this is on State Street, I don't know if you've ever been in Santa Barbara, but everybody was scared of me in that town, you know, just like from the police to everybody. Nobody wanted to mess with me, you know, but uh, I remember I'd go out in the middle of the street with two 25-foot bullwhips, and i like, bam, you know, when you crack them, you're breaking the sound barrier. So it sounded like, like a bazooka going off, you know, and I'd be like, bam, bam, bam. And uh, sure enough, people would come from all over that street to come down there and see what the hell's going on and see me in the middle of the street cracking the whips and everything, all dressed in my crazy gangster outfit, you know? But Corey told us uh, one time you were, uh, when you were in jail, uh, getting some uh, designs or something. Well, um, Corey Miller, you know, I really, he's a, uh, he came a little bit after me, yeah. and uh, but... I remember when I first saw his work, I was like, wow, this kid's great, you know? And I've always been, you know, like, uh, you know, I guess because, you know, I did what I did. You know, I helped bring it in, you know, so you can never take that away from me, you know? But I don't get jealous or envious or, you know, I invite uh, new, art, new artists and stuff. And I was always open and cool to them when other people would be jealous and give them a cold so shoulder. You know, Corey went through a lot of hating, you know, like they didn't like him at first. Nice looking guy, band member, you know, like, uh, and doing fucking beautiful tattoos and introducing a new style of dragon. He did a lot for tattooing, you know, so I really, I really liked him. So, uh, when I was in, um, in, uh, jail that the one time, this is, uh, before I opened my tattoo shop in 93. So I had to do a year in a county jail. And uh, but I came out in a magazine article. So me and uh, one of my gangster friends, we go roaming around the jail with that magazine, right? And when the sheriffs would see us, they'd say, "Hey, what are you, you two? What are you, you know? Where's your passes and stuff? You know, because you can't go roaming around the jail." And then right away, my my homie would say, "Hey, boss, you know that's what you call a cop's boss." He goes, "Have you heard of Freddie Negrete? He's a tattoo artist. Look at he's in this magazine and stuff." And they go, "What?" Yeah, and I go, yeah, and uh, for uh, ODR, that's officer's dining room, you know, that's the food that they eat. For a plate, two plates of ODR, I'll draw you a tattoo design. And uh, and then, I would, so they'd come, I would draw them the tattoo design, and I would send them to Corey Miller. And then, you know, they'd give us two plates of food. <laughs> so, and then at that time, you know, because uh, the sheriffs always would take care of me, and I'd have a special juice card with them, you know. They put us in a special cell. We had a shower and we had two tables. One was an art table, you know, and I had every kind of pencil, marker, everything that I needed, you know, to design right there. And then we had our food table and we had ice chests with ice cream in it that we refilled ice and we had bread and peanut butter and jelly and just like nobody was living like us in jail. <laughs> and so uh, uh, being connected to Corey Miller back then, was uh, helpful because I was able to to give them the tattoo design and then say, okay, all I had to do was go to Corey Miller, his tattoo shop in Upland. Most of the sheriffs live in that area or around there, you know. So Corey Miller got got to know me, you know, be, before I knew him real good, you know. He just knew that I was sending all these sheriffs to him. So uh, how do you uh, look at the way uh, he's taken all this, uh, the fame from the TV shows and stuff? I think great, you know, like, of course, you know, um, anybody, I mean, if I was going to be on a TV show and all of a sudden, you know, everybody wants my autograph or, you know, everybody knows me and stuff, you know, that, that's going to go to your head a little bit, you know, but, uh, I think, I think Corey, like, he's really kept it real and he keeps a humble, you know, uh, a humble attitude about it. I, I never sense any kind of attitude from him at all you know about it and maybe that's just because you know it's with me and we're really good friends and stuff like that but he's really kept it real and he had a hard time because uh when he want when he was 
you know, asked to do this thing, and uh, he went and shared with different people. Well, you know, some of the main people, you know, uh, I, I shouldn't even mention names, but they they uh, didn't like it. Yeah. And they even told them not to do it, you know. They are like, no, don't do that. And uh, when he came to talk to me about it, you know, I, I would feel honored that he included me as part of one of the main guys that talked to him. And I was like, do it, man. You tell me which one of these guys that says don't do it wouldn't do that. You know, and, and uh, just do it and be as real with it as possible and represent tattooing as best as you can in our style, our black and gray style. But do it, bro, you know, do it for you, do it for your shop. And fuck with her, you know, forget about what everybody says, you know. That was uh, my advice to him. And he told me the other night when I seen him, he's like, man, thank, you know, thanks for giving him that advice, you know. Yeah. I would do it. <laughs> you know, they asked me, I, w- I would love to be on TV doing my thing, you know. Yeah. So, you know, and when, it, when it's over, you know, people will always remember him and want to go to his shop, you know, and want his work, you know, so... You know, even though they they probably don't pay him a lot of money, you know. No, he told us he made less money than Yoji did on Miami Inc. Oh, really? <laughs> but you know, it's, if it's not for the money, then the money is not important. Right. Uh, I want to talk more about you. What are, what are your uh, plans for the future now? You want to stick around here and? Yeah, I'm gonna. You know, I can't see myself leaving the strip. I don't have any plans of uh, doing my own tattoo shop or anything like that. You know, that's a really a lot of work, you know, and it's really a lot. Of, it could be, like, really stressful. And, um, you know, we have everything we need right here, you know. And um, and what one thing that, you know, for my side thing, I'm doing music again, you know. So I do vocals for a group, you know, and, and I, I have this great producer who's produced a lot of people and, and uh so him and I just uh, finished a new song, you know. Like, I already did a couple albums, you know. We didn't get signed, but, you know. Uh, actually, we got signed uh, to this one record record company, and we got paid a little bit and everything, but, uh, and it was Tyson Beckford's company. But then he uh, went under, you know, and he had to file for bankruptcy. So it was unfortunate for us, but it was a testament to how, how much talent we had in the group, you know, so... Wherever that you know, wherever that goes is neither here nor there. I just want to do it. Yeah. You know, it's fun. It's like an addiction. You know. So you doing any more movies uh, in the future? Well, you know, uh, Freddie Blau, he's uh, retired now. Yeah. But his uh, his daughter owns the company, and uh, recently I I designed a. See, I forgot what movie it was for. You know, I I, I designed it for him. You know. If, if they need designs, they'll come to me, you know. But as far as the days of actually going on the set and doing it and everything, those days are over. But, uh, you know, I'm still really connected with uh, with Freddie Blau. And i was been thinking about maybe doing a book. Uh, Freddie Blau photo documented every movie and every TV show that we did together. So... Uh, all the material that we have would make for a pretty fat chapter. So, you know, I'm thinking about that, you know, doing a book. Mm-hmm.